Welcome everybody to this Zoom meeting amongst friends and tonight we're going to have a formal debate, a little different from our usual format. It's going to be the shorter form of debate and I will now explain it briefly. The motion before us tonight is as follows. Women in the canonical scriptures and tradition of the church during the first millennium are portrayed as having no voice, no agency, and as the originators of sin. Speaking for this motion for the first 10 minutes will be Judith Davy. Speaking against the motion for the next 10 minutes will be Malanga Throw Stephen Smith. There will then be five minutes again from Judith in response to what Melangath has said, and five minutes from Melangath in response to what Judith has said. I will give one minute warning before the conclusion of each speaker's time. There will then be a summing up from the proposer from Judith for five minutes, a summing up from Melangath of her position for five minutes, and then there will be a 20 minute period for debate. There will be no vote at the end. This is for our mutual enlightenment. So the clock will now start ticking. Judith, over to you. You're proposing the motion. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, friends. And for me, the key word is portrayed. How someone is portrayed doesn't necessarily represent actuality faithfully and completely but we'll get to that. Let's first look at voice and agency. Jesus was born into a strongly hierarchical world where power, decision-making resources were concentrated in, in the hands of men and women's roles were much more restricted and tended to be in the realm of the home, the indoor space. And there were clear expectations about what constituted gender appropriate roles and what was seen as, as proper. Overstepping the mark was censored. The realm of men was much more external, more in the public domain. People noticed the actions of men. They remembered the names of Jesus' male disciples, his brothers, but they didn't record or remember the names of his sisters, nor their deeds. And with some notable exceptions, I would argue, women are not clearly visible in the Bible. Yet, there are clues that women were there and did indeed play a role during Jesus's life and after his death. And although the scant mention of female disciples earlier in his gospel, Mark notes at the time of the crucifixion that many other women had journeyed from Galilee to Jerusalem. They'd followed Jesus, provided for him and ministered to him. So why did Mark mention these women at this point? Well, all the men had deserted Jesus in the garden at the time of the arrest. And he needed the women to make the link in the scripture between the Jesus that was crucified and buried, the empty tomb and the resurrection. And if it wasn't for this, what would we have known about these women and their roles? Yeah, interesting question. We, we also know from Luke that the 12 male, disciple, 12 male disciples were with him as he went through the cities and villages. And Luke mentions the presence of women too. Joanna and Susanna were mentioned by name and one or two details about uh, Joanna and her husband, Herod's overseer and her resources. And she would have been relatively well known in society and of reasonably high status. One of the arguments that some people make for women staying at home is that it's God's plan for men to work and financially support the family. Women have always worked and supported their families monetarily, but we're told here by Luke that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna and other women provided 
for them out of their resources. So they financially supported Jesus and his ministry. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Greek word translates as, uh, as translated resources means uh, finance, property, possessions, and potentially non-financial means as well. And I'm sure some might say that what they gave Jesus was really um, what their husbands made. And that might be true for Joanna. She's the only one that's mentioned with a husband in the passage. But Mary Magdalene had no husband and Susanna is not paired with a husband in these verses. We don't actually know where these resources came from. But maybe they were businesswomen like Lydia or Priscilla. Maybe they were widows. But in the scripture, neither woman nor her resources is tied to a husband. So women were there, but they were barely visible. They were certainly not given voice. So why have thinkers elided women's provision of resources to the Jesus movement? What about women's agency? Well, Mary Magdalene first captured public imagination, but not in a way that's faithful to the scripture or what I understand of her enormous contribution. She was mentioned numerous times in the Bible, but must have had, must have had more voice and agency than is portrayed in the words. One minute, it, Judith, one minute. Okay. The 10 minutes is pretty strict and it goes very quickly. Yeah, you're fine. I, I'm just, um, okay, I, 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 I'm moving on. I'll move to the end. Um, so um, the, the creation story, the, um, the um, women as the uh, origination of all sin, um, Augustine um, clearly had uh, things to say here, and he was um, influenced by other Jewish Platonic uh, scholars. Um, and he set the tone for generations. Fast forward to 2009, when Jimmy Carter said, I've been practicing Christian all my life and a deacon and a Bible teacher for many years. My faith is, faith is a source of strength and comfort um, as religious beliefs are to hundreds of millions of people. So my decision to sever my ties with the Southern Baptists after 60 years was difficult and painful. And it was to do with uh, the Southern Baptist movement carefully selecting a few verses and then ordaining that women must be subservient to husbands and were pro prohibited from serving as deacons, pastors or chaplains in the military service. And in many countries with different <laughs> faiths, we still see what could be regarded as a very literal outworking of Deuteronomy 22, where women are brutally murdered and maimed, but the same standard is not applied to their male counterparts. And the so-called honor-based violence, which happens in this country as well as um, elsewhere, um, you know, is, is, is here and now. And corrective rape occurs in Christ, um, countries identifying as Christian day in, day out. I must so, apologize, Judith, just quickly. No, it's fine. I'm sorry, I've knocked it up. No, 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 no please. I must apologize because I was looking at the wrong place on my phone and I was looking at the time of the weather. So you do actually have another two minutes if you want to go back to something you said before. So this is me apologizing to you. I'm not doing my job properly. You've got another two or three minutes, please. All right. So... Um, let, let, let's take stock. So I, I'm suggesting that hi history was written by men, for men, in line with the patriarchal norms of the day, and potentially to ensure that those norms continued. Constantine and his attempts to keep the empire together 
wrote women out of the picture by enabling a narrative that appealed to the military. Women disappeared from art, and to use the idiom of the day, uh, today, uh, he gaslighted women and his thinking enabled others to do the same. So consequently, the role of women was much more constrained moving forward. So I said from earlier for me, the word portrayed is the key one in the motion. I would argue, although perhaps not presented it very cogently, and I apologize for that, that women in the Bible are portrayed as having no voice and no agency, but there are clues that lead us to believe that in actuality, women did have a role, did have a voice, had some agency and played significant roles despite the constraints of the norms that they were operating within. Okay, and I would one, also- One minute, one minute now, Judith. One thank minute. you, thank you. And I would also argue that women be portrayed as the originators of sin is well documented. There's some interpretations that suggest a more egalitarian view, but thinkers like Constantine conflated the story of the fall with sex and Constantine made it much more problematic. And we can see the evidence of this perception in our everyday lives in the here and now, for example, on a killing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Judith. you. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Judith. I do apologise for... No, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not, that, I that wasn't as cogent as it could have been. No, but... I, I, didn't, I didn't help by giving a wrong time. So thank you very much indeed. Melangus, you have now 10 minutes. It's nearly quarter to eight. So we're going to stop at five to eight. OK, off you go, right. Melangus. Thank you. OK, I, I hope to prove that the um, notion of the proposal in, I have to say, too brief a time because there's lots to say, is built on misinterpretation of scripture and a lost knowledge of tradition over the centuries. St. John Chrysostom said in the fourth century, being a woman is not an impediment, certainly not in the church. It is the work of divine grace that this sex should be impeded only in the affairs of this life. So in scripture. Readings Roman 16 specifically would indicate that women had voice and agency and were not regarded as the originators of sin to a greater or lesser degree than men. We meet Phoebe, the deacon, Priscilla and her husband, and throughout Paul's writings, many others teaching, preaching and serving in different roles. Priscilla is mentioned before her husband Aquila every time we meet them. Addressing the woman first in that period was unheard of and indicates that she was the most important. There is also Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Junia and Andronicus, another married couple, Julia and Nerus' sister, Rufus's mother, Chloe, and Euodia and Syntyche, his fellow workers in the gospel. Despite this, confusingly, St. Paul wrote, among other things, I do not permit a woman to teach, a woman will be saved through childbearing, and she must be silent in the church. People have misinterpreted and misconstrued these statements to subjugate and silence women through the centuries. In 1 Corinthians 14, St. Paul writes, when you come together, everyone offers a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, and, or an interpretation, but everything has to be done orderly. From this, it is clear that everyone in the congregation contributed to the service, including women. So how do we reconcile his statements? Silence. We need to read St. Paul in the context of first century life and culture. Women had very little choice of lifestyle, especially if they lacked wealth. The church was rarely the first to offer women an alternative to marriage and motherhood, and that was the monastic life. Generally, women were not educated because their role was in the home. The issue is that women were gossiping in church. St. Paul was trying to teach them and they were not listening, or they were asking questions and so missing the next point, or disturbing others. So he said that they should be silent, submissive, and they should wait to ask questions later, for that was the only way they would learn. Teaching. I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. The Greek word for authority used here is a very specific word used for absolute authority. It is used for God, and people like apostles and evangelists and bishops. 
why does this passage seem to suggest that women cannot teach? Because it's speaking about usurping the authority of the episcopacy. The bishop is the repository of right doctrine. No one ordained or lay can take a service, teach or preach without the authority of the bishop. This is not referring to authority in general. From Acts, we know that women had more general interpersonal teaching authority, where Priscilla catechized Apollos in the faith. And in 1 Corinthians 7, it is clear that a more knowledgeable wife could teach her husband. There were women educated and strong in the faith. We see that St. Paul had many women helping him in sharing the gospel, his teaching ministry, and that he was extremely supportive of them. Women were not barred from any office except that of presbyter and bishop. Women could do anything, did everything, and still do, according to their abilities. Scripture reflects that women had more voice and agency within the church than they did in society. They had the benefit of education and also more choice. They were limited mostly by the constraints of society. As for being originators of sin, Genesis 3 states that Eve ate the first fruit, but Romans 5 states that Adam caused sin to enter the world. Eve being deceived does not necessarily imply that she is to blame for original sin. It can be thought that because Eve was deceived, while Adam clearly knew what he was doing, that his sin is worse. However, scripture never states that Adam's sin was worse than Eve's. Both were punished for their sin. St. Paul believed personal life circumstances were not a hindrance to salvation. The slave is to serve his master above and beyond what is required. Women are saved through childbearing. Their salvation came through their role as mothers, guiding and teaching their family aright and living with Christian integrity. This applied also to men, doing God's will in the situation they found themselves. Both are redeemed through the incarnation and both work to their salvation by living righteous lives according to their calling. In tradition, in the fourth century, St. Ephraim of the Syrian makes the point of Eve's sin being reversed by the incarnation by alluding to the first Eve giving birth to Cain, who murdered his brother, and Mary giving birth to the life giver. Jacob of Sarug, the late 5th, early 6th century homilist and writer had the same message of Mary rebuilding the foundation which Eve broke down in Eden. Andrew of Crete in the 8th century, a bishop, refers to her being the second Eve. He looks upon the lowliness of his handmaiden and decreed an end to the curse of the first Eve. He, like those before him, saw salvation intrinsically connected to the reversal of the fall from grace by the first creation. The incarnation through the agency of Mary the Theotokos and the Holy Spirit reversed the actions of the first Adam and the first Eve. This was and is the teaching of the church since its inception. The hymns and prayers composed by these people and others through which each generation learns the theology of the church are still in use and have been in constant use through the centuries since they were written. In Britain alone, are hundreds of saintly women commemorated in the prayers of the Orthodox Church throughout the year, but are largely unfortunately forgotten in the West. Among them, the Saxon Saint Hilda, abbess of Whitby, a mixed monastery of men and women. She led one of the most important religious centers in the Anglo-Saxon world. In 664, she hosted the Synod of Whitby. It was her influence among others, which set the course for the future of Christianity in Britain. Saint Eta, the holy abbess, is known in Ireland as the foster mother of Christ's saints because she cared for hundreds of children in her lifetime, several of them becoming saints themselves. One, who she had herself baptized, grew to become St. Brendan the Navigator. He had such love and respect for her that he always asked for her blessing and the protection of her prayers before pilgrimages. Throughout the world, there are thousands of known female saints from this period. There are probably many more thousands unknown to us who lived quiet lives of faith. Thankfully, we also have records of some female Christian writers of the first millennium. Perpetua of Carthage, martyred in the third century, wrote her powerful story of conversion, which ended in her death um, by martyrdom. Egeria of Galicia, pilgrim and writer, wrote the travels of Egeria. She recorded in her three-year stay, the Eastern Christian liturgies of Jerusalem. 
There are many others. There is literary evidence of women deacons, particularly in Constantinople, and archaeological evidence in a number of other areas in the empire, particularly in Asia. One example of a woman from Constantinople being a deacon during the post-Constantine period was Olympias, a well-educated woman who, after being widowed, devoted her life to the church and was ordained deacon. These preceding points in scripture and tradition serve to illustrate that women of the first millennium are portrayed as having both voice and agency. One and minute, one agency minute now, Melangus, one minute. Thing. If women had no voice and no agency in the scripture and tradition of the church, we would not know about them. They would have been forgotten, lost without a trace. And we Thank you, Melangus. Time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malangus. OK, we've now got two sets of five minutes. First of all, for Judith to respond perhaps to some of the points uh, Malangus has made or maybe to add additional ones of her own. And then another five minutes from Malangus likewise. So, Judith, over to you. Five Thank minutes, you. please, to Thank respond you. to Malangus' uh, uh, points or to add others of your own. Yeah. So for me, as I said earlier, the key word in the motion is portrayed. And when I look at the scripture and, um, you know, the writings of the early church, I don't see, I don't see, I don't feel the women described in as much color or shape or form as the men. Now, I, I can absolutely see they were there, they, they contributed, um, you know, there were female disciples, um, deaconesses, Phoebe, as you said, Melangus, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't come through in, in text and colour for me. In, in the scripture. As I said earlier, if, if there hadn't been that, um, that verse in the Bible about there were others, um, you know, other women and needing to bring in the women, Mary and others as the link between, um, you know, the, the crucified Jesus, the, the burial, the, the tomb, the resurrection, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have known about, you know, Joanna, Susanna, and, and all those other people. And possibly, possibly, because I'm still learning about the Eastern tradition, this is where my tradition differs from yours, but, but I can't, I can't see, I can't see, um, I can't see those women. I can't see those stories. They must have been there. I, I know that, and there's clues, but I can't, I can't see them. And, and that's why I wanted to argue for this, this motion that, that women didn't have voice and agency. It's not that they didn't, but they were portrayed as not having voice and agency. And you know, portrayed as being the originators of sin. And I've not spent so much time on that because I managed my time very badly and I apologize for that. But again, I, I think it's to do with portrayal, not actually what was, but unfortunately, because of some of the thinkers, um, you know, uh, over the centuries, that that still that still remains when we think of honor based killings, some of those things, you know, corrective rape, as I said earlier, that happened day in, day out um, in this country, as well as as well as other countries with other faiths, that 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 kind of thing where. You know, there's been something that's brought shame or, or some crime or some something. Um, but the punishment is not equitable in, in, in that sense. So I think that still hangs, hangs over as well. So um, I loved what Melangath was saying, really interesting, thank you. Um, you know, I absolutely admire you. 
um, I think we've got a different view, a different perspective. Um, I hear what you're saying, but for me, the voice and agency was there, but it's not portrayed. Okay, Judith, you do have one more minute if you want nah, to. I'm done. Thank you. You. Okay. <laughs> you do have five minutes to sum up your position um, after Malangath has spoken now. So but just... I might change my position because she's very <laughs> persuasive. <laughs> well, that might happen in both directions. That's how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. Um, OK, Malangath, you now have five minutes uh, to respond to Judith and then both of you have five minutes to sum up. Malangath. Okay, I do think you hit the nail on the head when you say it's the difference of traditions. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think a lot of what you're seeing is social versus church. Um, you know, the, you know, things like honor killings and so on and so forth and being tied to the kitchen and children or whatever, that's a social thing. The women who followed Christ had enormous freedom. They, I mean, Chooser's wife, she was the, the wife of a very important Joanna. person. Joanna. Uh, no, Chooser. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Joanna. Yes, yeah, Joanna, right. Chooser's yes. yes. wife. Yeah. yeah. Um, she had, you know, she obviously had independent means. It was unheard of for a woman to go and do mm. that. She mm. obviously had tremendous um, agency. And I, I think actually... Uh, what is written in the Gospels is what is necessary to our salvation. It is what is absolutely necessary for us to know. And um, I think the important, the two important people in the Gospel really are Christ and his mother. Mm. Uh, you know, and Mary is very clear. And it's very clear that she has voice and agency. I mean, she was not just a little quiet, submissive woman. You only have to look at the wedding at Cana to, to see that. Um, he said, it's not my time. But she called the servants over anyway and said, do what he says. You know, she had authority. <clears throat> um, so I, I don't think that a lot, Augustine and a lot of other Western writers have been particularly helpful. I do think some of the Eastern Please writers not. also were men of their time, if you like. And there was a certain social view of, of women, but generally, if you look at people like St. John Chrysostom, who is supposed to be a misogynist, he really isn't, if you read it carefully. He's a great supporter of women. <clears throat> um, he, he praises women when there's praise due, as he praises men when there's praise due, and does the opposite when the opposite is due to both. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think some um, careful reading of the fathers is, is very important. And I think the whole atmosphere of the Orthodox Church has always been more equal. Women have, have always um, had a role. And so I suppose the atmosphere within the Orthodox Church is more, uh, well, we, as I say, we celebrate our saints. So we've always known these women and we've always known their stories. We have their hagiographies. Um, so we know their agency, we know their voice, uh, which is something that has very largely being lost in the West, unfortunately, mostly because of the uh, Reformation. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I would, I would definitely argue that they, where they are portrayed, they are portrayed as having agency. And, and where you see other things, it's possibly more a social thing rather than a, a church slash um, um, gospel thing you know we, women have always you, you look at the woman the well i mean men didn't talk to women <laughs> in those days let mm -hmm. alone a jew mm -hmm. talking to a samaritan and for the you know for the fact that it was recorded made her an extremely important woman and she went straight away and she preached and she taught yes. and she drew yes, disciples she you know and that's written and that's seen yeah. The stoning of the woman in adultery, that was a social thing. That, that wasn't uh, a Christ thing and it wasn't a church thing. So I, I think I'm just going to uh, leave, leave uh, that. Uh, I think also there have been a lot of too literal interpretations of, of scripture without proper um, study 
of the language used, um, the, you know, like the Greek word I mentioned to you about authority. It depends exactly how it has been orig originally written and meant to be understood. Okay. Oh, you've got 30 seconds, but you're not using them. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Malaga. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we've now got two um, sets of five minutes uh, for each of uh, our sisters here and they will sum up their position, not responding to each other, simply summing up their position. You don't have to use all the five minutes, but by all means do so if you need to. So over to you, Judith. Yeah, for, for me, um, I'm not, I, I, you say not responding to Melanga, so um, well, you can, you can I, I'll do, try but not do, to, yeah, but do. I think she raised a very important point mm. about the scriptures being about faith and um, in, ensuring that building allegiance to Jesus and, you know, the Jesus movement, um, that was their primary and fundamental purpose. They're not a social history. Mm. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. But... Because of that, because of, um, you know, the culture at the time, the story is told in a way that um, majors on the outside male space, but doesn't um, talk so much about the indoor female space. Um, and speaking about my own tradition, I think that it, because of that, things may have been either lost or not remembered or, or whatever. You can see the traces of these women, uh, the female disciples at the time and throughout, throughout history. I can see, you know, the female deacons, Phoebe. I, I, I can see all those things. But when I look at, from my tradition, uh, the scripture, it, it, it doesn't really capture it. And, and, and maybe it's because, um, maybe it's because of, of, of me and, and who I am and where I come from. Um, you know, I'm out there in the communities. I, I run charities. I'm out there on the front line um, in, in terms of, you know, many of the social issues that, that um, this country and other countries face. And because of my faith, I kind of relate that back to the scripture. So, yeah, lost my thread. But. That's all right. It's OK. You've got two or three minutes more, but if you're happy to leave it at that. Yeah, I, th I, I think so. so I, I do believe... I do believe from my perspective, my tradition, my reading of the scriptures and, um, you know, some of the, uh, the, the traditions that women are not portrayed as having mm -hmm. voice and agency. Yeah. But I, I do think they do. I do. Well, I do think they did. So for me, the issue is about portrayed. It's the portrayed word in the motion that is what makes me want to speak for it thank you okay melangath you're summing up please now and just that before you say start melangath say that at the end of melangath summing up there'll be a general discussion but i would invite you to ask questions of each speaker in the first part of that debate and then we can start mingling uh, comments between each other okay so over to you, Malanga, for your summing up. Five minutes. Thank you. Okie dokie. I mean, in, in addition to the Samaritan woman in the Gospels, we have Mary, we have Martha. Um, we have all the other people that we have mentioned. I do think they are, I think they're full of life. Certainly as an Orthodox woman reading the Gospels, I feel that they are portrayed um, well 
we know something of them. And because of our tradition, we know more about them because it's our family history, if you like, for want of a better description. So we've had all, in addition to the scripture, we've had all the stories of these people. This is why tradition and scripture are important to work together. If you just have scripture, yes, I can see how you would arrive at the conclusion that you have. But when you have the tradition as well, you know these people personally. You know them as living women, and they are portrayed in tradition that we have inherited as um, having agency, having voice, having been um, redeemed alongside of men from the fall through the incarnation, and that is the most important thing, and therefore not the originators of, of sin in, in that sense, because it was no longer important. It was, it was gone. Christ turned it all on its head. Um, and undid it uh, as through his his mother and the action of the Holy Spirit, you see. So um, then we have the continuation of the church and we meet all the people, yes, just in, in scripture blandly, um, if you like. I don't think it's particularly bland. Um, I think they're very well painted. But um, again, through tradition, we have this lively history and we know them personally. And then through all the generations, we know all these other thousands of women that have lived faithful um, lives, that have done um, God's work within the faith and within the church, spreading the gospel and working alongside men in an equal capacity, um, doing what is, is needed for the world. And I have to say just on a personal note that um, I was ordained an Anglican minister 22 years ago. I became Orthodox. And um, I have a far fuller, better, more interesting ministry than I ever did as an ordained woman in the Church of England. And I think this says something about the tradition within the Orthodox Church combined with scripture. And I'm in a long, 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 long line with all these women living out in my life the faith of the church. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. Um, so, okay. So within our allotted hour, we now actually have that 20 minutes. Um, we've perhaps run over if we need to. But let's try and keep to 20 minutes. Um, I invite um, questions, first of all, please, that you would like to address to either Melangath or Judith, and uh, they can respond, and then we can have a little chat about that and move on to the next question. Is that a good way of proceeding? Okay, who would like to put the first question in, please, and to whom? Can I ask a question? It's Christine. Hello, Christine. Hello, and to hello. Who, are you, who are you addressing this to, Christine? Um, I'd like to ask um, Malinga first, if I may. Uh, very interested at the end of your um, summary there that you were previously um, uh, an Anglican minister. minister. You mean the priest in the Anglican Church? Yeah, the priest, yes. Uh, uh, on what was the turning point that you came to the Orthodox Church? Because that's quite a, um, a, a prestigious uh, position to be in. Uh, what attracted you to the Orthodox Church? The truth of it, the fullness of it, the, the roundedness and completeness of it, and how it all actually fits together without the gaps that one seems to have in the Western Church. Without, sorry, With, I didn't hear the last bit. Without the gaps that one seems to have in the Western Church. Was it an epiphany or was it um, a slow journey? Uh, I would say almost that it was a journey from birth, um, <laughs> but because um, you can always trace your, your journey. But specifically, um, it was meeting church history, um, the history of liturgy, um, the history of tradition, and all these things that as a Protestant I had never met when I went to theological college. And I decided I had to find out what this original church was all about. And that began my journey with orthodoxy. And it, it then became something that I could, I could do no other. Yes. 
Yes, no, I understand. Being orthodox from birth, you seem, I feel that women have been represented. And I understand Judith's point of view about being portrayed. We don't hear so much about it because of, you say, the social reasons. But I've mm. never felt that women have been um, in any way subordinated. Yeah. I feel they have got a presence. I, um, I don't know how it, it's happened, but when I read the Gospels, I feel their presence, mm -hmm. especially, uh, obviously, um, Massy Borgia, um, Mother of God. I, I feel that she's there the whole time. Um, but the social side of it does have conflicts because I have lots of Anglican friends. Mm -hmm. And there's always been this view that women are not being portrayed properly. Um, and um, the women priest thing is a very big controversial subject. Mm. But I always feel in the Orthodox Church, we've been fulfilled. I've never felt there was any need for women priests. We've got to roll automatically. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. A, a role as priests? No, I'm saying we don't need to be priests. I feel that women in the Orthodox Church have a, a presence, have a, a position where, that, where they don't need to be elevated, if you like, to the priesthood they're already fulfilling a role within the church. And I don't, that's why I don't feel women need to be priests. I think they yeah. already have a role there. Yeah, and, and, and forgive my um, lack of knowledge about your tradition. And that's why I've been coming to Father Gregory's, um, you know, um, Zoom calls on a Tuesday evening to, to find out more. I, I've been to four or five now and love it. So um, you'll be stuck with me, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but what, in, in what way? Well, it's just from, from childhood, my mother had a very strong presence in the house in that she taught us about our faith. We pray together. My father was the provider. My mother worked as well. But I always felt that women were very strong in the church, the way they contributed in the church life, for example. Women have a very strong presence. They, I, didn't, never, I never felt we were subordinated in any way. I cover you, my so head you feel an equal church. presence? I, I cover my head when I go to church um, because I just feel it's the right thing to do. It's not about feeling, um, I mean, having to do it. I want to do it. It, it's, it's, the, it's part of, I don't know whether you call it tradition, it's just through faith, it feels right. And that's where we're moved by the spirit, when something is right and something isn't right, and you can't always explain it. No. But it, that's just an example of women, a, a lot of Anglican women will not cover their heads because they don't think it's necessary, but I do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can't explain that one to you, but that's something I felt has been normal to me for most of my life. But you see, Orthodox tradition, I'm from a Ukrainian background, comes with tradition. So a lot of things have come culturally, I accept that. Mm. But it's the part of women which we're, we're debating today. Yeah, I think, sure. I think women are very, very important in the church. I've never, I've never felt mm. subordinated in any way. Mm. Let's, have, let's have another question. Um, addressed to either of our two sisters in Christ here today, um, because we're, both of them are joining in in responding to these questions. So uh, over to someone else to make a comment or a question or any other contribution. Ooh, don't um, can I go, can I... Yes, Adrian. <laughs> um, I, I should uh, declare a, a completely partisan interest because I'm actually Judith's husband. Um, I've been fascinated by, by this discussion this evening and having um, heard Judith's um, uh, sort of some of her musings on, on the topic while she was preparing this talk, I, I think I, I'm really struck by the difference between the, uh, the sort of the orthodox um, traditions view of the agency of women. And what seems almost in the, the sort of Western, um, you know, the sort of traditional Catholic and, and, um, and the, the, the Protestant <laughs> school to be almost like women are, are just sort of the dark matter in the Bible. You know, they must be there, they must be holding things together, but they only sort of, they're, they're only visible sort of largely in, in terms of, you know, they are mothers. They are they they you know they they crop up occasionally, um, albeit at critical moments. In the case of somebody like um, 
Mary Magdalene. So I, I'm just, I'm interested to explore, I suppose there's a question for Melangesh. Um, the, what, how do you think we got to this point where the, you know, the different traditions have such a different view and such a different understanding of, you know, the, the visibility and agency of, of women in, 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 in the two traditions? Well, I, I think it possibly began um, with, the, with the schism and the gradual drifting apart of the Roman Catholic Church from the rest of its sister churches in the Orthodox Communion. Um, uh, and, and I think they, the Roman Catholic Church has always tried to tie things down. So, you know, a very Western academic sort of way of looking at things. And we, we you know, we must cross all the I's and dot all the T's and so on, you know. Um, and, and I think then when the Reformation came around, the baby got thrown out of the bathwater completely. <laughs> And people no longer venerated their saints, and they forgot all about all these wonderful women. I mean, it's, it's always been there, and they've always been a part of our history. Um, they've been written about, and they've been alive in the tradition of the Orthodox Church from the beginning. Um, but because they were lost sight of through the you know various machinations. I think that is how it, it has. And then there have been false interpretations of scripture, um, fundamentalist um, interpretations of scripture that have taken us even further down the wrong path in the West. I mean, you just think of, of headship. The father is the head of Christ. Does that make Christ less equal with the father? Are they the same matter? We believe in the Trinity um, and that each part of the Trinity has the same, has, has, has agency. They operate in a different way, but they are all equal. So when you talk about headship, um, women traditionally would run the home. They were the priests in their own household because they were educating and praying with their children and their husband in their home churches. Um, so... Uh, and if I may, Malanga, I might add that traditionally in the Orthodox Church, it's the women and the women alone, the mothers, who are charged with blessing their children. Absolutely, that's perfectly correct. So, I mean, if men, <laughs> women could take over everything, now there would be no balance in that. So in its wisdom, Christ and the, and the church have given men um, the headship of the family. But what is the body without the head? And what is the head without the body? You see, all are equally important, but all have a different function. Would you Don't rather you think, be... Malangas, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't yes. you think, though, I mean, that I'm speaking about the Orthodox Church now. Without doubt, there were female deacons in the Orthodox Church. Oh, undoubtedly church. there were. Absolutely let's, let's no doubt it. whatsoever. So no, why no. do we start seeing less of them from about the 8th or ninth century onwards? Because I, I think chiefly um, deacon, women deacons were about catechizing um, women converts. They were about baptizing women converts because people were baptized naked in those days. So you couldn't have men doing it. It was less acceptable for women to be visited by men in their homes to their sick beds. Um, so I think, you know, it was not so much a liturgical role as a service role. Uh, and I, I think that is largely why they began to peter out. But I do believe that there is still a role for women deacons. And I do think that the church will come back to them because I think there are specific things that women in the church would prefer to talk to a woman deacon about than they would necessarily to a priest. I mean, mostly at the moment, it's Matushka or the Presbytera that women will go and talk to um, about certain matters. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the, the general sort of gist of it. But I mean, in the Antiochian church, there are still women that serve in the altar. Nuns still serve in the altar. Um, so it hasn't completely disappeared. And of course, women were ordained with the same right as the men in the altar with the same prayers. But I know that uh, 
Judith wants to come in now and uh, make a comment or a question. Judith. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me lower my hand. Um, yeah, so I can see there were female deacons and I'm, I'm on a track. I hope to become a deacon. Um, mm -hmm. But what 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 I'm not sure about is, you know, this this um, segregation by by gender. That because uh, you know I, I can understand it back in um, the time in which Jesus was born, but but let's think about the, the the here and the here and now um sorry i i'm, I'm struggling to formulate my words but it's all right take your time but but why should um men and women have a different role I don't I think that's that. That, that, that is a crucial, really the crucial nub of the question. You know, you can say that we're all equal, but if there is a differentiation of role, then let's that understand needs, that. Yeah, let's that understand needs, that. that. Let's that, talk that needs about that. That needs examination. That needs examination. Yes. yes. I was going, sorry, I don't know how to put my hand up. I'm going to put my no, hand no, up. it's fine, Malanga. <laughs> we, we can see it. We can we can see it. <laughs> Over to you, Malanga. Take um, us forward on this. As I was going to do, continue with, with the whole headship thing, um, women are good at everything, and they're particularly good at what is called for in the priestly role, uh, which is a, a, a healing ministry, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. Women already run the church. They already run their families. What is there for a man to do? If women then are priests, the whole thing will be out of balance. And, you know, I think for a lot of men, becoming a priest is part of their salvation because it takes an extremely special and different kind of man to fulfill the role of priesthood. I mean, not every man is called to, or asked to, by far the majority of men are not called to be priests. No women. Maybe very few. Um, and Christ decided that his 12 um, immediate followers were to be men for whatever reason he chose it. There were also many other, um, this is, this is the, we, we use the word apostles for the 12 now, they were always called the 12 originally, and apostles were anyone who had known Christ in his life and also saw him resurrected. So there were hundreds, possibly thousands of people who were actually apostles. Men and women. Men and women, you oh. see. Yeah. Um, so he chose the 12 to be priests, but everyone else was a were apostles. Um, and they, they and, 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 and of course, this needs saying, Malangas, I'm sure you would say, but we're running a bit short of time. Yeah that a number of female saints who are missionaries in the Orthodox Church are given the title equal to the apostles. Mm. So, for yeah, example, Nino, Nino yeah. who is the evangelizer yeah. of Georgia, the first Christian kingdom. Yeah. How on earth did she manage to convert the royal household and from thence the whole country if she was not a powerful preacher and teacher and evangelist? Mm. Equal to the apostles. Mary Magdalene, equal mm. to the apostles. Mm. We've retained that, haven't we, Malanga? We have, and women do not need to be priests. They have the priestly role in the home and with their families, and they they you know do do everything do everything else. You know. <laughs> I do. Like, I do think, though, Malanga, I'm not here to be an apologist for the Orthodox Church, although I am an Orthodox priest. I do have serious concerns that what was originally part of our tradition the elements of it over the centuries have become progressively neglected. Well, yes, I agree with you. Do you have um, any sympathy for my point of view? Um, 
you know, I'd be more than happy to see the diaconate um, re reintroduced. But I mean, we can still be ordained as readers and as chanters and as we can give us a wave, Joanna, she because she's my chanter in chief. Yeah, we can we can we can preach. We can do all the the important things. I mean, ah, we ah women can preach. They can preach with the authority of the bishop. Yes, yes they can preach. But how many times do you see it? Well, you don't see it very often. I think it possibly happens a little more in in America. But the fact is that you know women and men, if they're going to preach, have to be um, theologically trained. Correct. And that is the important thing. You see, even a priest, it's not part of the priestly role to preach unless he's been theologically trained. And not all priests have been theologically trained, so not all priests can teach, can preach. Yeah. Because you know, in Gre I mean, in Greece, for example, it's a very strong tradition that the preacher is the best theologically equipped person in the community. Absolutely. Who isn't, who isn't necessarily the priest. No, that's quite so. You see the big difference, uh, Judith, between the Eastern and Western traditions here. A priestly ministry, this was called into question at the Reformation because of Rome's particular understanding of the Eucharistic sacrifice and what was going on there. So whereas the Protestant tradition is fine with Jesus the prophet and the derivatives from prophecy, which is preaching, fine with Jesus being uh, you know, uh, the king, the ruler, the, the ruling presbyter in Presbyterianism, all that's fine. But as soon as you focus on Christ, the priest, that aspect becomes distorted in the West. This is what we would say about the Orthodox understanding of priesthood, because it's interesting, Judith, and I want to throw this on to you now, that in our rite, which is the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, what you and I understand as priests are never referred to as priests, but as presbyters. In Greek, ereos is reserved yeah. to Christ. Yeah. Now you think, no, you know, this is a this is a, a, a very much a Protestant understanding, but it isn't because it's, no, it always, isn't. it's always been there. Because the presbyters were the delegates of the bishop as the church grew and there were not enough bishops to go around. God forbid that we should multiply bishops, right? So instead... <laughs> I, no, that's I, hilarious I, sorry no 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 that's fine i'm quite happy to say it um so the church in her wisdom decided that oh, we'll have these things called presbyters to take their place when they're not around but whenever our liturgical rites refer to the priesthood it's always the priesthood of all believers which might be a little bit surprising to you yeah yeah i i, I guess it is because I'm uh, a local preacher, you know, I, I study at Cliff College, I'm on this, um, this track, I study diligently, I'm doing really well on it, but I, uh, I preach once a month across, across Hampshire. Right, okay. Um, and you know, it, it, it's an assessed, um, my preaching is assessed, yeah. and the assessment go back to the superintendent of the circuit, but there isn't the same sense of um, gender or, forgive me, reserved occupation around uh, yeah. priest, um, but but forgive me, Father Gregory uh, Malanga. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I don't know how to say your name. So, Oana, she's had a hand up for ages. Oh, oh I'm so sorry, Oana. Yeah, right, yeah, with your yeah. permission. So, uh, you know, I'm with, happy with to come permission. back in again. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm very but sorry. I wasn't con looking conscious for the of that somebody that. Say. Right, the floor is yours, Oana. I, I guess I just wanted to add from the position of a choir leader is um, I approach this high calling with uh, humility and um, prayer. Uh, when I'm looking at the services, the way they're being performed and served in, 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 in the church, um, there's a lot of participation from the part of the choir as well, as it is 
in, from from the priest that is serving the liturgy and the all of the other altar service. Of course, the liturgy is sung in antiphones, which also involves the congregation. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that um, we are very present without being ordained to this ministry. We are very present within the manifestation uh, of the service within the church building and out in the society as well. And we have the gift of the Holy Spirit that is very strong and powerful and works through us. And as I said, I always approach the, the ministry that I do have in the choir with a lot of prayer. And not once I had to pray throughout the service to the mother of God to help me finish uh, the whole service because it was long, it was lengthy, uh, you know, especially during Pascha. And um, yes, it, it happened. And I, I've been given that strength. I've been given that power, which I didn't know I have. I prayed for it. I prayed that I would be able to, to do the service. I've served Pascal services for the first time this year on my own. And I've had to rehearse at home, which I've enjoyed and was a pure pleasure and a blessing to be able to do it. But the point I'm trying to make is just to say that the gift of the Holy Spirit is within us and it works through us without us sometimes being aware of it. Uh, we partake of the Holy Communion, we say our prayers, and we approach all this ministry uh, in humility. And we are not worthy, I don't feel worthy, but I feel that I'm given strength and power to uh, fulfill this ministry. And I feel fulfilled with my role in the church. And it's part of the universal priesthood that we all have, and we've always had. Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to say, sparing her blushes, what a wonderful <laughs> ministry she has because she, she is our canto. And I think that when you're trying to understand the Orthodox tradition of worship, you need to remember that there's two aspects to this. There's a continuation of the synagogue, first of all. And in the synagogue, the cantor is the most important person. And mm -hmm. Joanna has far more words and prayers dedicated to her in her ministry in the services at St. Aidan's than I do, just if you count the words and the prayers and everything else, you know? I think I want to say also that the second part of the liturgical uh, part, uh, uh, worship of the Eastern Christian Church is not the synagogue, but it's the temple. So what goes on, as it were, <laughs> goes on, sorry, what goes on, as it were, in the altar area, okay, is a specific representation of the heavenly temple to which we all now have access through the sundered curtain and the open resurrection tomb entry into the kingdom of God, sacramentally, but also eschatologically. It's interesting that the actual area in and around the altar table is described in language redolent of the Revelation, Revelation, the, uh, uh, the final book of the New Testament, with the Lamb on the throne, surrounded by the elders, the prayers of the saints. So there is this fusion of the synagogue Remember, Hannah was a prophetess in the temple as well, you know, prophet, um, uh, 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 recognizing the infant Christ. So it's this blend, this interactive sense of worship and this blend of male and female. Now, I said I'm not here to be an apologist for the Orthodox Church, but I just ask people who are getting to know the Orthodox Church better that in many ways we are radically different from the late Western Latin tradition, both mm -hmm. Catholic and Protestant. And if you want to understand the position of women in the Orthodox Church, the best way to do it is to come to our services over mm -hmm. a significant period of time. Now, I know we've got a little yellow hand from Judith, and then I'm going to come back to Malangath. And then perhaps we ought to wrap it up unless there is an <laughs> urgent question from someone else. So first of all, to you, Judith, please. Well, you know, thank you for all you've said. Absolutely thank you for all you've said. But... Th there was something for me, and, and I, I guess this is me understanding the, um, 
well, my own views, but also the views of the Orthodox Church. Um, I don't understand, given everything Juana said, why she couldn't be a priest, a deacon, or, or whatever. That that's the first thing, and and the second thing that I just wanted to say in um, in conclusion is what is the relationship between the divine and the scripture and the world in which we live? <laughs> and another crucial question you put in here. We need to be really mindful of that because we, we we might, you know, um, I'm, I'm not a scholar, I wish I was, but, um, you know, we interrogate the scripture the best we can with a good heart and prayerfully and all, all, all the rest of it. But if, if that's, if we think that that's leading to something in the world in which we live in 2022 what 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 do we do about that you know um yeah how do how yeah. do we yeah how do we relate our practice to the culture in which correct we live? correct and the god that i know wants me to speak truth to power and and, and to to talk about these things, which is why I've been so uh, grateful for, um, you know, you, Father Gregory, inviting me tonight. Oh, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure mm -hmm. and a blessing. I mean, really has. And I hope I've not spoken too much. I've tried to augment the discussion. No, no, you've been and wonderful. Shall we... Um, Shall we go to Malanga fi finally, and uh, then we'll wrap, wrap up the session. I just want to say something before everybody goes about the next session, um, which will be in one month's time, and I'm going to explain why and how and what. But finally, Malanga, some reflections. Right. I, I think, firstly, one needs to remember that the church is... Um, here to modify us, not for us to modify the church. We are not to be of the world. Um, we are different from the world. Uh, while we still have to live in it and relate to it, I appreciate. The other, the other point I think I would make is that the Western view of um, structure in the church is very much pyramidical. And you think of a power structure, very much like a business power structure of a top-down sort of a thing. In, in orthodoxy, it's very much flatter. And this is what the priesthood of all believers is about. And while the um, doctrinal truth resides in the bishop, and therefore he has the, the final authority on teaching and preaching, if he is getting that wrong, the priesthood of all believers can boot him out. Absolutely. And, and has happened. And has, and happened. has happened. If he yeah. is not abiding by doctrine and truth. And so therefore there is complete equality within the Orthodox Church that you don't actually find in the rest of the world, although it's seeking it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the canons of the Council of Chalcedon, the Fourth Ecumenical Council, obliges, obliges Christians to desert a heretical bishop and to seek out an orthodox one obliges i mean that that is almost inconceivable in a western context i mean people do do that i mean they start going to different churches if they don't like what they hear maybe they should hear a bit longer before they make a decision you know it, people flipping churches just because they don't like something is a bit too me centered as far as i'm concerned but I think there is this right. A lot of people look at the Orthodox Church and think, oh, you're very conservative, you're very traditional, nothing ever changes, you know, it's all this patriarchy. But actually, there's a revolution nearly always bubbling in the middle of her 
because the and I think that's right and I think I am not satisfied I make a final personal statement if I may I am not satisfied that the orthodox church today is fully respecting her own tradition in relation to the roles of women of which Judith and Melindeth have very capably spoken so yeah I, I am a faithful son of the church of Antioch and loyal to my bishop and everything else but I think that there's a lot we need to do in the Orthodox Church to make a more honoured space for women seeable. And this is what you're saying about portrayal, Judith. You know, mm. I want to see Orthodox women preaching. I don't want people to say, oh, I've never seen that before. When there's a woman being allowed to preach in an Orthodox mm. Church, largely because people are not well acquainted mm. with our own history. And if, we, if people were better acquainted and it's not just Orthodox history, is it? It's everyone's history. If people were better equated, acquainted with their own history, they would know that the picture sometimes is quite different than what many people assume it to be. Mm. Now, next time, this is going to be radically different, okay? Are we still, yeah, yes, Judith. Yeah, um, so uh, apologies that I didn't, present my argument as cogently as I would have wished. I've got a paper. Can I send that to you, Father Gregory? And, Absolutely, and maybe please. you send that round to colleagues and friends. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Thank you. The, the same opportunity is afforded to you, Malanga, to Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Now then, next session is one month's time on Tuesday the 21st of June and we're going to have another uh, debate in this format and the motion this time is going to be and I quote the gap now I've said orthodoxy you could say any kind of Christianity but we can only speak from within our own experience here I think on this one the gap between orthodox Christianity and society in Britain is now so wide that words must give way to deeds if we are to make an impact on this culture for Christ. Wow. Yes. Sorry. You like that, do you, Judith? I right. do. I do. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Speaking, no. You know, I, I, you know I'm you keep doing Christ, this, you know. you but keep I'm in the world. You do, look, we are blessed to have you, so stop apologising. That's fine. Um, so speaking for that motion will be Subdeacon Chad Lyon, who is uh, a missioner in our newly created mission of St. Hibbold in Scunthorpe. I think wow. you know him, don't you, Malanga? I've and, known him uh, many years, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking against the motion uh, and rescuing some primacy for the word will be Mr. Philip Williams, who was oh. going to chair this debate yes. tonight, but of yes. he was called away to something else that he had to go to. So that's Tuesday, June the 21st at 7.30. And what oh, I'm who? proposing is we'll experiment with this format, um, but we'll have it just once a month for a while. Maybe we'll have one in July, but then we'll give it a rest in August and come back in September. Mm. So I'm also asking you for topics for debate for July. So come back to us in June, hopefully on the 21st, and perhaps some ideas for July. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. And thank you to all of you who've been watching this on social media. Uh, please do consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. This is the promotional bit. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing hopefully all of you and many more again next time. Thank you very much indeed, thank everybody. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. now going to stop recording.